control the kitchen chaos and streamline your back of house operations with Restaurant Technologies. Restaurant Technologies Total Oil Management Solution is the end-to-end -end automated oil management system that delivers, filters, monitors, and recycles your cooking oil, taking the dirtiest job out of the kitchen and lets your employees focus on more important tasks. The Total Oil Management Solution helps prevent the burns, spills, slips, and falls that come from traditional oil management. Restaurant Technologies gives you and your employees peace of mind among the chaos of a commercial kitchen and can maximize efficiency for your business. And no upfront cost! Learn more about Restaurant Technologies and the solutions they offer by visiting rti-inc.com or call 888-796-4997. Welcome to Menu Talk. I'm Pat Kobe, Senior Menu Editor at Restaurant Business, and I'm joined by... Brett Thorne, Senior Food and Beverage Editor of Nation's Restaurant News and Restaurant Hospitality. Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm Brett. Brett. Yeah, nice to see you. Likewise. So Brett and I both went to a fast casual called Brine this week, where they wanted us to try out some of the new menu items and kind of evaluate them. Um, so that was a fun experience. Uh, we, I, they, it wasn't all media. They were, they told us it was their hundred top guests who were also invited, but there were a few media people invited too, and Brett and I were among them. Although we went at different times. Yeah, um, but it's. I think that's such a smart thing to do to bring in your regulars who, like, they want to be treated like they're special. Everyone wants to be treated like they're special. Mm -hmm. Bring them in, and then instead of hiring a consulting company uh, for whatever tens of thousands of dollars, and you know having it evaluated that way, you can actually feed it to your most loyal customers and get their feedback. Right, and uh, and they needed some feedback, so that was good. Yeah, well, it is an unusual fast casual, and they, they really do make everything from scratch. And they, the reason it's called brine is because they brine the chicken and grill it rather than fry it, which makes it really tasty. But they were trying out a new sauce on the brined chicken. So what did you think of that? Delicious. And, and brine only has two locations. There's one mm -hmm. in uh, the Manhattan neighborhood of Chelsea and one in Fairlawn, New Jersey. Uh, I thought their chicken was succulent and really tasty, and they, mm -hmm. they called it an umami sauce. It was definitely had umami. Yeah, chicken does. I, I thought it was really, really tasty. It was very good, and I asked him what the umami was. You know, what he used to make it taste umami-ish, if that's a word. Um, and it's he not. said he actually. I mean, he used MSG, which is getting more acceptance now. So. That's good to hear. And it, it, it really didn't, I mean, you never would have known it was MSG. It was really tasty. It was like a, almost like a barbecue sauce, but a little lighter. Yeah. And MSG is delicious. It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a very convenient way to add umami to something. And it's, it's a common ingredient in a lot of Asian cuisines. Nothing wrong with it. I really like the Brussels sprouts. That was one of my favorites because they were just like, I guess, oven roasted Brussels sprouts, which you don't normally find at a fast casual. And they just were very tasty and a great side dish. Yeah. And like everyone wants to fry Brussels sprouts and serve them with bacon. And I, I'm, I'm quite tired of that, Pat. I don't need to have <laughs> Brussels sprouts fried with bacon anymore. And uh, these were a little bit sweet, but not too much and, and very tasty. And I was very excited to see the elote corn ribs. Mm. Like, um, I mean, the corn ribs are now, I think, a bona fide trend where you take the, uh, the cobs and you slice them vertically and then you fry them like they're ribs. I suppose you could roast them or do anything else to them like they're ribs. And I mean, obviously they don't eat like pork ribs because nothing but pork ribs do, but it's a cool presentation. They're fun. They can be vegan. They're certainly vegetarian. These were not vegan because they were all covered in cheese, but mm -hmm. they were very tasty. And, and I, it's a fun finger food that uh, I think we're going to be seeing more of. And obviously, major suppliers are now providing them for restaurant operators. So. Right. They're well, um, the chef had Brian, though, said that he did it himself. He, oh, okay. He cut them vertically himself, and he put katika cheese on it, I, I guess. Um, some other and some herbs it was they were quite tasty 
Yeah. The one side dish I didn't really care for were the uh, Tostonis because they were a little, maybe they were a little overdone, but they didn't taste much like plantains. And I think he should stick to the things that he, you know, that are roasted or grilled because that's kind of what the concept is known for. Yeah, I didn't I didn't love the Tostones either. And in general, I think I have an anti-plantain bias. Because whenever I have them, I think, you know what would make these better? <laughs> if they were either bananas or potatoes. <laughs> and, you know, maybe that's a North American bias thing. But bananas and potatoes are delicious. And plantains certainly have their their place and and they're they're great in the in the proper settings of you know mofongos and other Caribbean stews and stuff, but like we have potatoes, give me potatoes. Yeah, true. And I had actually done a story on his house made pop tarts, which are kind of a signature there. That he wanted to do a dessert that was portable but was easy to execute because he couldn't bake cookies in the back of the house, so. He was able to make these pop tarts by laying out pie crust and filling it, and then covering it with another sheet of pie crust. And now he's um, he tried a variation on the original brown sugar and cinnamon pop tart, and now this one was filled with chocolate, and it was almost like a s'more pop tart. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way, but yeah, that's a that's a good description. And my my feedback uh, for them was more chocolate, which is how I feel mm -hmm. in general about everything that more chocolate would be good yeah. um but it was it, i mean it was nice and flaky and and i i certainly ate it all but i would have liked a little bit more generosity in the chocolate so what else did you do this week Brett? well i had some friends who came from out of town from silicon valley uh who i hadn't seen in a few years and they wanted to meet for dinner and they said how about momofuku and i thought really Momofuku, because these are these are uh, trend forward people, and uh, the the man in the couple is a friend of mine with whom I worked in Bangkok. So he's well versed in uh, East Asian cuisines, and his wife is a Korean American of high standards. And <laughs> so, in general, like Momofuku, obviously is a very popular restaurant. Uh, in fact, you're your colleague Peter Romeo was one of a very early booster of uh, mm -hmm. Momofuku back when your offices were near there. I uh, never was completely enamored of it, and in general, Asians, Asian Americans, kind of don't understand what the big deal is because it's yeah, it's Asian food. And uh, David Chang's genius was introducing it to a neighborhood of people in uh, in Manhattan's East Village who hadn't bothered to go, what, a mile and a half south to Chinatown or two miles north, uh, northwest to Koreatown and, you know, have actual delicious Chinese and Korean food. So he introduced people to uh, who weren't accustomed to those dishes, to things like pork buns. And people were like, oh, my God, pork buns. I've never heard of such a thing. You know, they're pretty common. And now they're, they're commonplace many places. But, but I give David Chen credit for for being ahead of his time in that regard. And he, back uh, long ago, he did some very creative things at some of his restaurants. Mm -hmm. I remember having kimchi apples. So, I mean, they weren't quite kimchi, but they were apples with sort of kimchi sauce on them, let's, let's say, with labna on top, you know, the Eastern uh, Mediterranean mm. over cheese thing. And I thought that was a really smart, interesting combination. Mellows out the kimchi a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Now, and in that particular dish, this was years ago, he put a bunch of bacon on top, which I thought was mm. totally gratuitous, but people do like bacon. So, But anyway, we, we ate there, and he has a new sort of tomahawk pork katsu. So, you know, he pounds out uh, the pork so that it's, it's huge and thin and then breads it and he serves it with a Japanese-style uh, curry sauce and rice. Mm. So we ordered that for the table and that was good. And, and the, everything else was better than I remember it being. Like they're, they're maintaining a good uh, sort of East Asian game there with mm -hmm. um, a really nice tuna tartare and kimchi that actually got the seal of approval from me and my Korean American friend. We were like, this is actually quite good kimchi. 
And so good for Momofuku. And the kids were happy, mm -hmm. which was the whole point. Right. Um, and Momofuku also happens to be around the corner from Veneros, the mm, pastry uh, place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Known for its cannoli and, you know, <laughs> and went there and, and the kids had cannoli and a rainbow cake and another thing. And, and I had a double espresso. And, uh, yeah, it sounds like a fun night. night. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think one of the unusual things about Mama Fuku, I, I went to Mama Fuku Co. I never went to the original one, but no. it was really oh, that he, he introduced like a different vibe to an Asian style restaurant than, you know, you would find in Chinatown or Koreatown. So I think that was part of the whole allure, you know, in the early days anyway. Yeah. I mean, fun, uh, sort of generally Western pop music, a little more cutting mm -hmm. edge. I guess. Um, I don't care for the uncomfortable chairs that uh, are at a lot of his restaurants. And for a while, that was the thing uh, at avant-garde fancy fine dining ish restaurants in New York, was you would sit in uncomfortable chairs. And I've, I'm old enough now that I want some back support. And yeah. I don't, I don't need to sit on a bench while spending all of my money on the food. I like, yeah. please give me something comfortable to sit on and, and you know, no, I agree. I, I remember a lot of complaints about that, you know. And what do you think about Pete Wells leaving his position as the restaurant critic at the Times? That's kind of interesting. For right. Reasons. Yeah. I mean, he'd also been doing it for 12 years. Which, yeah, that's a long time. But we say this, each of us have been in our jobs for more than 20 years. But um, nonetheless, reviewing restaurants is... Taxing. I mean, even our jobs are hard on the Constitution. And, yeah. you know, we don't have to go out and review restaurants, but we get to go out and sample a lot of restaurants, uh, which certainly hasn't been the best health choice for me. But uh, after coming out of lockdown, I've been I've been working out, and, you know, mm -hmm. getting my steps in and lost a little weight. And I'm working on that. And um, it's but definitely I can, paying off. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. That's nice. Um, and and so I can relate to what Pete Wells was saying about that. And also mm -hmm. his understanding that he's, you know, he's more than his job. And mm -hmm. and I actually met Pete years ago uh, before he was the critic when he was, I think, editor of the food section of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. He's just a nice, straightforward, down to earth for a New York Times guy. Yeah. Guy. No, I've, I've enjoyed his reviews, but I could totally understand. I mean, I really try and limit myself to two restaurant meals a week. And he really had to go out four or five times a week, which I think would I, it would definitely ruin my health, too. And yeah, it, it takes its cholesterol. cholesterol. <laughs> yeah, all of that. And um, so good luck to him. Yeah, uh, see well, what he does next. It'll be interesting. And 12 years is quite a long run. I mean, I, I don't oh, yeah. know. If anyone else did it for that long, yeah, Ruth, that's right. It was a, a few years, and Samson yeah. was just a couple. Before that was Ruth Reichel. I don't need to go back for the the entire history, but twelve years <laughs> is a good long run. It's definitely and, long, and he did a good job of kind of upending how the Times reviewed stuff, and that he really went to out of the way places that mm -hmm. weren't just the big marquees and. and I think he really helped uh, expand his readers' horizons when it comes to food. So kudos to Pete Wells. Yeah, definitely. Well, I had the um, privilege of talking to a chef, Jacob Bickelhop, who is the chef at Conroe in West Palm Beach. And he has actually trained, he's a self-taught chef, and he trained with Charlie Trotter back in the day. And he also worked at Alinea, so he's worked at very high-end places. But he and his wife wanted to settle in West Palm Beach because of the lifestyle. And his wife is the sommelier, and he's the chef. And it's a very small restaurant, only 10 guests per night. They sit at a chef's counter, and he does a multi-course tasting menu. I think there are at least 10 to 12 courses and it's $350 per person, but he gets lots of repeat guests. And it was just very interesting to hear his whole perspective on the restaurant and on fine dining. So I wanted to play a couple of 
clips about it. Um, he starts by talking about the kind of rationale behind his tasting menu. That's all I do. I've been doing tasting menu since I started my own cuisine. Mm -hmm. And that is definitely a part of my experience, my training, if you will. And I also think as far as how I like to cook, um, which is a, it's really artistic expression. I always say flavor is always first. I want everything to taste good. And, but it's very artistic and it's, it's a way to basically tell a story. You don't write a book with just one long chapter, do you? You break it up in a progression of um, ebbs and flows and three different acts, if you will, and you have to have your your crescendos. And so it, it it's another element to express yourself instead of just having delicious plates and you can do one or two or three or let people uh, order a la carte. They you know, I have over a hundred thousand hours of experience. They just trust in me to create a, a tasting menu of beautiful things that they have no idea what's going, what to expect. Yeah. I think it's pretty cool that you don't even know what the menu is when you go in. And it's, I mean, I'm, I mentioned to him that it's kind of like an omakase, but he does a couple of Japanese influenced things, but it's really much broader than just a Japanese menu. But People really don't know what they're going to have when they come in, so it's a total experience and surprise. Well, omakase is is a style; it doesn't have to be Japanese. Food, right. So. That's that was my thinking. But and, and in fact, years ago, when I was talking to Danielle Gulu, he pointed out that the tasting menu uh, also started as a sort of omakase thing in France, or what's now a degustation was a variation on either kaiseki or omakase, depending on, on who you, how you want to interpret Japanese cooking. But in the 80s, a bunch of Japanese chefs came to France to learn French cooking because the economy in Japan was out of control good. So, you know, mm -hmm. they, the Japanese traveled all over the place to, to learn and bring stuff back home. And uh, so when the Japanese chefs got to France, they taught French chefs about tasting menus, and here we are today. Interesting, yes. There's a lot of crossover between the okay. two, for sure. Well, then, um, Chef Jacob talked a little bit about the space, which sounded really interesting. I mean, it's all part of the story, so. Basically, how we do the tasting menu and how my wife and I, we don't have any other employees. It's literally just her and I, so oh, really? wow. a chef's counter is the way to go um there's other ways you can go about it. you can do like one big table which i've done in the past but a chef's counter where everybody sits around basically a stage um what i call the chef's pass it's a, it's like an island where i plate and cook everything mm -hmm. and so it's an experience for the guests as well as for us because we kind of feed off of their energy and so that's part of it so the ambiance, the experience, the build out of the restaurant needed to be comfortable, warm and cozy. But at the same time, everything's refined. All the, the from the equipment, from the paint, from the Japanese shisugi bomb with this cypress burnt wood from Japan, brass handles and everything. So I, I want to make sure everybody feels like we didn't cut any corners. Everything is just top notch. But then they almost feel like they're coming into our home. And people say that all the time. Mm -hmm. And having basically sitting around an island where I and my wife feed them and you know, give them non-alcoholic uh, pairings that I make or the beautiful wine pairings my wife uh, offers. And so the chef's counter is the key. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it sounds really interesting because I don't even have a dishwasher. Um, you know, a person employed as a dishwasher. They clean up, they serve, they do everything, which... Sounds like a lot of work. Well, they, they're they only doing the tasting menu, I think, um, from Thursday through Sunday. So it isn't every day of the week, but it does well, seem really unique. Well, it's a, that's, a, I think, a smart way to run a restaurant. I mean, tasting menus for sure allow you to control uh, your cost of product because you know exactly what you're going to be serving. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they fill up every night because they have, what, you said 10 seats? Ten seats, right? Yeah. So, and there's there's enough money in West Palm and Palm Beach and surrounding areas. 
they can certainly handle that. So I, I imagine, as I said, that they fill up every night. And then so you can really control your costs. And then obviously you have the husband and wife team. So apart from uh, the challenges of being married to your partner, which is, I'm sure, challenging, like you don't have the drama of uh, other restaurant workers. Right. So well, one of the reasons he didn't want the dishwasher to be there was because it would ruin the ambiance, you know, since it's such a small space, you would hear like dishes clattering back there. So I, oh, I, anyway, well, the, sorry, I was going to say the theater in the round kind of dining thing is, has been around now for quite a while. I think mm -hmm. it, maybe it started or I first saw it at Catbird Seat in Nashville. Right. And it's it's a cool way to eat, you know. You you if you your chefs are of the right mindset, I think. Like you want, and Co, where you've dined, has has a similar style, mm -hmm. Um And if the chefs are the type who want to engage with their guests, it can be a really fun, cool experience. I've also experienced where, you know, the cooks are just busy cooking, and they hand you the the plate and aren't that great at eye contact, and that's that's not as much fun. But, well, it's like having a dinner party at your home, like you right. said, but he does it every night for four nights or five nights in a row. So he also talked, you know, I asked him if he had any signatures. He changes the tasting menu all the time, but there are a couple of things that he described that sounded pretty awesome. The menu is really never the same twice since there is no menu and I have all the flexibility in the world to change it as needed based on what I can get and the beautiful products. And cause some things are, I can get a farmer will come and say, Hey chef, I only have this much and it's enough for say a week or a few days. And then I change it. So that's great. That gives me a lot of flexibility to be creative. But at the same time, there is a few things that um, are either uh, signatures or uh, techniques that are always on the menu. So I'll start with the name of the restaurant, Conro, which is a Japanese grill. It's like a yakitori hibachi grill, mm -hmm. but uh, it's really about how you use it. And I always grill A5 Wagyu, which is a Japanese beef of the highest quality and grade. And I grill that over Japanese charcoal, pichatan charcoal, in a, in a tare, which is like a soy sauce that I made about a decade ago. And then you keep adding to it. Think like a mother to a starter. Oh, wow. In Japan, they have it for generations. Mine's a decade. I'm really proud of it, but not as amazing as uh, in Japan. However, that technique with the A5 Wagyu and how I grill it is always the same. And it literally is the name of the restaurant of that process on grilling it on a Conroe. And then I have this really, uh, what I think is cool and delicious and fun of uh, this golden egg dish so these beautiful porcelain uh, golden egg bowls that I got from France that uh, it took about a year to receive and make like this beautiful risotto dish and this six hour poached egg and duck fat. And that's been a signature. It's one of people's favorite dish. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I have to keep commenting because everything sounded so unique. But um, Yeah, I want an egg poached and duck fat for sure. Yeah. About six hours, probably a sous vide kind of situation. Sounds great. Yeah, I've never had, um, you know, steak grilled over the Japanese charcoal. I wonder what the, what the difference is in flavor. Well, I mean, pinchotan is, gets very, very hot, so you can sear it quickly. Um, I think I've had wagyu over it, although mm -hmm. now that I say that, I'm not sure. But, I mean, I'm a huge fan of A5 wagyu. It's delicious, and it melts in your mouth and has... You know, I mean, usually it has a lovely, you know, caramelized flavor on the outside and then just a rich unctuousness inside. And um, mm, it sounds I'm great. Supporter. And it's it's become so popular now. That and caviar are, are you know, as well, we have this sort of multiple economic situations going on uh, in the country where a lot of lower income people are pulling back. But. Boy, the luxury products are certainly doing well. And uh, so there's a lot of Wagyu and caviar being consumed. Out yeah, there. definitely. It's kind of like what we always talk about, you know, restaurants do with their menus, barbelling it. Right. Well, now restaurants are barbelled. There's like the really high end ones and the lower end ones. And the yeah, ones I, in the middle are getting squeezed a little. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, a yeah. tough time for restaurants.
Well, I also asked him, you know, where the clientele comes from. So now we're very close with them. So it, it's a mix of everything. And that's, it's, it's wonderful. Like how lucky are we to be able to have that big of a reach as well as being able to be in friends. And they also support us being with our neighbors. Yeah. So he, what he, what he started to say when I rudely interrupted was that, um, that people come from the surrounding area, but they also come from like far away, you know, from around the world because they hear about this restaurant, which has only been open um, about a year now. So, but they, the word has spread and people come for special occasions, you know, like they'll make a reservation for a birthday or anniversary. And some people are repeat customers and come back often. Um, One of his customers is, lives right across the street from where he and his wife live. And he never met him before he came into the restaurant. So, Oh, yeah. well, I, mean, I, I, I can relate to that. Often you live near your neighbors forever and, and never meet them. So um, what else did we, we talked about how um, Chef Bickenhoff is now six years sober. And that's why he created this non-alcoholic pairings. And the way he makes them, um, they're very, very labor intensive, but really interesting sounding. So he explains that and describes all the, you know, a couple of them. Understand what she does because it's so special that she. I made a mistake. He's talking about the wine list now. Oh, oh well. Sorry. So let me go back. He's talking about how his wife um, chooses the wines. So. Really favors grower producer. Uh, winemakers because they have control of the whole process. It's really a, a lot of like what we do, and they. It seems to be just in my opinion, uh, they have a lot more passion behind it. It's not to say there isn't passion in some other uh, ways to do it, but like you're really growing the grapes from a from start to finish, and you can pick them and grow them in a certain way to fit exactly how you want your wine to taste. And I really think uh, that show is, at least in my opinion, I'm a sober chef. I'm six years sober now. And uh, so I don't really get to taste them. But uh, I do know, like, based on what I hear and the the guests' feedback. Yeah. So that's how they choose the wines. His wife is an accomplished sommelier, so she does all the wines. Um, And now he's going to talk about how he does the non-alcoholic pairing. I make everything. I make everything in house, and uh, and it's very special. And everything's like it almost looks like wine at times because I clarify it to the point where it's like crystal clear and perfect. But I'll explain like the red wine that I am making right now is for the egg dish. So I know a lot of times she'll do an Italian wine with Nebbiolo grape juice. So I was able to get Nebbiolo grape juice from Italy, and I made a pairing with that with. Uh, Thai long pepper, which has a lot of like, not spice in the sense of heat, but like nutmeg, almond, uh, vanilla kind of notes to it Mm. with, and then tannins are really important because especially if you have richer food, you want something that tannins kind of dry out your mouth a little bit. That Mm -hmm. is good for fattier, richer foods. And uh, I used raw black walnuts. If you ever have like a walnut and it kind of dries your mouth out, that's tannin. So I, I use some of that. And I use different things like uh, local mulberries and some dried shiitake mushrooms for earthiness and some other things. But it all comes together and it's so good and it's beautiful. And I clarify all that to the point uh, that I have to use. I use something called agar, which is made from seaweed. And it's like a gel mm-hmm. property and you freeze it. And then you thaw it out over a cheesecloth in the fridge. And that structure creates this like uh, lattice kind of structure and it naturally filters out the liquid while it's thawing and it becomes crystal clear, not like crystal clear, like water, but like it will look like it'll almost look like wine, but with all the flavor that I added to it. And I, and I'll mirror my pairings off of uh, my wife's Nadia's uh, pairing so that they have the same experience, if you will. Right. And it's really, really special. And I'm really proud of that. Yeah. I mean, it's extremely labor intensive and he does that for each of the pairings. Yeah, I mean, if he if he calculated his own labor cost, I imagine the uh, non alcoholic beverages is more expensive than just you know buying that bottle of wine and opening it up. 
Yeah, that's probably true. But he said that 25% of the guests actually order the non-alcoholic pairings. And sometimes it might be, you know, a husband and wife or a girlfriend and boyfriend, and they'll share them. Like, you know, they'll each get one or the, and each of them will get either the wine or the non-alcoholic, and then they'll swap so they could taste both. But it's really um, extremely interesting because as we, you know, we've talked about this before, that non-alcoholic pairings are becoming so popular now, but few of them are this, you know, intricate. <laughs> yeah, that's hardcore. And and it it also shows that the, the fact that that couples will share the wine pairing and the, the non-alcoholic pairing, that it's not just sober people who are veering away from alcohol. I mean, no. I, it sounds like in this case, they just want to try it because it sounds really cool and, uh, and fun. But also drinking half of what you would otherwise drink at a meal is probably a good idea, especially like if you're in West Palm, you've probably driven there from somewhere. And so not right. would be good. No, I tell you, know, that, that would appeal to me because I don't want to be drunk at the end of a meal. So right. it would be nice to sort of alternate, you know, the non-alcoholic and the wine. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And, um, and because he put so much effort into it, people who don't drink uh, and therefore might have just, you know, had a glass of water or whatever with their meal could fully be uh, engaged in the experience and, of course, pay for it. Well, that was a really interesting interview, but um, what else is happening? The Olympics start? It sounds almost sacrilegious to say I don't really care about the Olympics. And, you know, I'll pay attention. I'll, I'll watch some stuff. Oh, I'm sure they'll be playing. If I, if I go to bars, they'll be playing the Olympics. So I'll get into it. I will find a way. Because it's, you know, even though I'm not a regular follower of sports, watching people who are the best at what they do do that thing is really inspiring. So I'm yeah, it'll be fun. Well, especially yeah. because it's in Paris. I mean, seeing Paris is always rewarding. True. And, and I do. I love the gymnastics mm -hmm. um, and some of the other sports where it just people are just so good and you can tell how hard they work. And it's inspiring. Yeah. Some restaurants and bars are actually doing like Olympic themed cocktails and um, food items. I actually did a little story on that, but I don't know about New York. New York is a little too, um, you know, snotty for that kind of stuff, but we'll see. Maybe oh. But New York is New York is like France, unlike some parts of the country. New York is, is oh yeah, definitely a profile country or city. And uh, I actually wrote about a uh, uh, in my new on the menu column. There was a cocktail called Vive la France, made with uh, French gin and Saint Germain, mm -hmm. or, and uh, served on a, a three colored ice cube made with oh fun okay so, yeah yeah. Well, maybe we should uh, go to a French restaurant at least and celebrate that one. That's not a bad idea. Control the kitchen chaos and streamline your back of house operations with Restaurant Technologies. Restaurant Technologies Total Oil Management Solution is the end-to-end -end automated oil management system that delivers, filters, monitors, and recycles your cooking oil, taking the dirtiest job out of the kitchen and lets your employees focus on more important tasks. The Total Oil Management Solution helps prevent the burns, spills, slips, and falls that come from traditional oil management. Restaurant Technologies gives you and your employees peace of mind among the chaos of a commercial kitchen and can maximize efficiency for your business. And no upfront cost! Learn more about Restaurant Technologies and the solutions they offer by visiting rti-inc.com or call 888-796-4997.